And so we're now recording. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming today. I especially want to thank um, Sam and Jenny for uh, hosting this on the uh, ULVLC um, series. Uh, it's great to have that as part of this. I want to acknowledge um, the support of our Dean, Mike Crumpton, who's continued to um, fund this even through these hard times. Um, so we appreciate that very much. Um, and I would like to go ahead and acknowledge uh, the members of the committee. I'm Scott Henshaw. Um, Kathy Griffith is our chair and has been our chair for the last several years. Uh, so I wanna thank her for all her hard work. Um, the other members are MK Amos, uh, Mac Nelson, Ann Owens, Juanita Thacker. And uh, this is a new um, member that we have and a new uh, thing that we started. We're going to have a student employee uh, representative on the committee, which I think is great. Uh, Gray Benson, uh, some of you may know them. Um, and uh, so that's a new thing that we're doing. Also, I want to mention that this year's um, there's been a change to our statement in that uh, a student can apply for grants as well. Um, all of the information that I'm gonna talk about, by the way, is on behind the stacks under the Innovation and Program Enrichment Grant Committee. Uh, the application is there, the application form. Uh, you can go there and download that and send it to Kathy. The instructions are all there. Also, you can talk to any of us on the committee. That's fine as well. If you have questions or you need help, uh, with anything, just let us know. We're happy to talk to you. Um, the award is for up to $3,000. And keep in mind that you don't have to do the full award amount. If you had a smaller project that you wanted to do, you can do that. Um, or you can, you can do a bigger project and submit a request for the, the total amount. That's fine too. So there's flexibility. So don't let you know, if you have an idea that's maybe not as big as $3,000, put it in anyway. Uh, it's possible that we can fund something smaller, okay? So um, all of that having been said, I wanna give you the dates. Uh, for those of you who don't already know, the way this works is if you put in your application by May 20th, which is not too far off, 15 days, um, you can get feedback from the committee, which may help you um, actually get your grant selected. Um, the final applications are due uh, 5 p.m. June 10th. So up to, if you send your application in before May 20th, by May 20th, you can get feedback from us that may help you get your grant accepted. Uh, after that point, you still have until June 10th to, to send it in, but after May 20th, you won't get feedback from the committee. I should also mention one thing that we've changed, rec changed recently is that we've uh, included on behind the stacks the uh, some of the past winning applications. So you can take a look and see how people have written these uh, applications and see what the winners' applications look like. That may help you to formulate your own or see what see what it's about. So I don't want to take uh, too much time from our pre presenters. Um, I think up first. We're gonna have uh, Melody is gonna talk about their project. And I do wanna acknowledge the people who worked with her on that. That was uh, Deborah Caldwell, Melody Rood, and Olivia Patterson for the Anti-Racist Resource Library. And they're gonna talk about that. And uh, if there are any questions after that, we can do that as well. And then after that, we'll do um, our most recent winner. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, is everybody seeing my slides here? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, oops, okay. All right, hi. Um, so I'm Melody Rude and um, uh, yeah, I just wanna acknowledge, you know, it was just acknowledged, but that this was not something that I uh, created or wrote myself. Um, I had the help of Olivia Patterson, who was a then LIS um, student, graduate student, who is now the student success librarian over at UNC Charlotte. And Deborah Caldwell, our um, former uh, diversity resident, um, helped me write this grant. So 
I'm Melody, you know me, I'm the Student Success and Open Education Librarian, um, and I'm one of the co-organizers of the Anti-Racist Reading Group, alongside um, Suzanne Sawyer, Olivia when she was here, Jenny, and Deborah when she was here as well. Um, but yeah, that is a group that we got started up uh, in 2020, and um, we've been trying to have sessions, you know, once a month, but uh, I would say in the this past semester, um, you know, with, with everybody leaving, we, we haven't had as many sessions, but I hope to have those um, start happening more often. So what is the anti-resource, um, or sorry, anti-racist resource library? Um, so essentially it is a curated mini library with books that focus on anti-racist themes. And the reason why we wanted these books um, to be in our possession is because, um, uh, in 2020, when several people were trying to access um, some of the same uh, anti-racist books at the same time, we noticed that a lot of people couldn't get their hands on them. Um, we didn't have uh, unlimited access ebooks to a lot of them or any access to ebooks. Um, and we also didn't necessarily want to take those off the shelf for our students. So we came up with this idea to have a mini library um, so that the books could remain non-circulating to be used by library personnel at any time that they want to. Um, and I would say this is literally open to any library employee, including student um, employees as well. Um, so it is for um, employee use only. So we're not you know, taking any um, books off uh, um, the shelf for students or patrons to use. Uh, there's a very informal checkout system um, where we, essentially just, uh, uh, you just grab the book and I put your name in a spreadsheet. Um, and this was sort of created to coincide with um, the anti-racist reading group. Uh, so if we decided to uh, focus on one book, we wanted to have enough um, books for everybody to go around. And you know, generally, depending on the session, we have anywhere from like seven to 11 participants. Um, so we, we try to keep that, those numbers in mind when we are ordering multiple copies of the same book. Um, but we also just want it to be there for you know, personal growth reasons. Um, you don't have to have any reason to want to read one. Um, it is just available to you. And then we also um, requested um, extra funds because we wanted to have honorarium funds to invite guest speakers to coincide with the anti-racist reading group. Um, so we uh, we were able to invite Twana Hodge once and uh, we reached out to a couple of other people, but unfortunately, um, you know, like many things that sort of launched during uh, the pandemic, uh, a lot of people just weren't available for for extra things. Um, so but we, we did reach out to some people. Um, but yeah, that was a little bit about the grant. So the application process. So we requested $3,000. Um, so that was for the purchase of books, eBooks and honorarium funds. So we um, purchased some um, unlimited access eBooks as well. Um, so the breakdown, what we were looking at was uh, two $500 honorariums, um, $1,800 of books and $200 we sort of set aside because we weren't sure when we were gonna get the books and if we were going to use them for the anti-racist reading group. And again, this was during COVID when a lot of us were still at home. So we wanted to have funds just in case we needed to ship people, uh, the materials, um, as well as marketing stuff, but we ended up not needing to have to use that. Um, so in terms of curation, we were um, specifically looking for books written by um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Uh, so things that address racism in libraries, uh, we have a, um, a few selections that are uh, library specific, so how uh, uh, libraries uh, perpetuate systemic racism, um, but also sort of introductory books to anti-racist work. Um, we have physical books and all access ebooks, just like I mentioned. And one of the things that we wanted to do was that we really wanted to make sure that um, we were purchasing locally and not uh, through Amazon. So even though it was a little bit more money and we, we probably uh, could have gotten more had we gone through Amazon, um, we wanted to uh, 
purchase the books through Scupper Nongs, um, aside from the, um, you know, Gobi purchases, but uh, that was uh, a decision that we had made. Um, and um, uh, Mike and Robin were really supportive of that. And then uh, in terms of speakers, you know, we uh, created a list of honorary speakers that we wanted to um, contact. We did contact three to five people, but again, uh, you know, COVID impacted a lot. So we didn't end up having as many speakers as we would have liked. So these are just some images of the books that we have. Um, so, you know, we have, so you wanna talk about race, racism without racists. Um, so we have some, you know, sort of introductory um, uh, intro to anti-racism anti -racism, um, books, but then we also have books like Pushing the Margin and uh, uh, Topographies of Whiteness, um, and I would say Algorithms of Oppression too, which I feel like, uh, you know, relate to the work that we do. Um, and uh, Where are All the Librarians of Color is another example. So checking out materials, I mentioned that it's a very informal process. Um, so we have this website. Um, it is the um, anti-racist reading group site. Um, this is just a screenshot of it, but um, uh, it is uh, it has all of the materials on there if you want to see um, exactly what we have. Um, yeah, that's it. So we created this uh, Google site that uh, has all of that information there. And this is something that um, I personally, you know, uh, one of my personal goals is to sort of pick this back up. Um, we wanted to have uh, recordings uh, with our uh, guest speakers on there. And we also wanted to um, include links and all of those things to past readings that we've done so that it sort of is a place that stores all of that information for us. Um, and actually, I don't know if I chose the right share screen option, but I'm going to try to go to it. Do you all see the website or are you still yeah. on the slides? Okay, perfect. Great. Uh, sometimes I choose the wrong share screen option and it doesn't show. But yeah, you can scroll down. Um, the, the site is just um, uh, uh, UNC. Uh, I think the go link is a RRG, if that helps. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, you can scroll down and see all of the books that we have. And again, you know, this is something that we've been wanting to work on, but past readings and things we've listened to. Um, and then uh, we have the recording of Twana Hodge here from Visiting Speakers. Um, but yeah, that is where you can go to see the books, but they also live in my office behind me. Uh, so if you ever just want to pop in my office and look at them, you can do that as well. Um, so here are the books and um, shout out to Suzanne who helped me with this sort of cataloging process. Uh, she created all of these labels for uh, the spines here so that we can kind of just keep track of them. Again, you know, I said it's very informal and it is, but, you know, we just want to make sure like, you know, we have eight copies of this and we want to make sure that like all eight copies are accounted for. They're somewhere um, out there. Uh, and in order to do that, we... Um, we created a spreadsheet that has all of um, our titles and the number uh, copy that we have. And then there's a borrower option, you know, check out date, check in uh, date. There's no, uh, you know, we, you can have the books for as long as they need them. Um, and unless there's a situation where somebody else uh, really wants to read the book, um, it, it's fine. Um, we're not keeping up with it um, um, too strictly, but yeah. And that is essentially it. Uh, so I can ask questions. Um, I, I'll just say real quick though that, um, you know, like I mentioned, two of the um, folks who helped me with this uh, are no longer um, at UNCG. And so uh, it did sort of, um, uh, it, it sort of became sort of I'm trying to think of the right words. It wasn't a major priority to try to market this at this given time right now, um, but I, I definitely do want to start promoting it again because I think it's one of those things where um, people would absolutely use it. Uh, they just forget that it's there. Um, and hopefully maybe one day we can find um, a location for the books that's not my office so that people can feel comfortable just uh, going and grabbing it if they want to.
Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing now. That is it. I can answer any questions. If uh, nobody else has a question, I would just want to ask you, Melody, after you, since you've been through this um, once, I, I wonder if you have any advice for people who might be interested in doing a grant, submitting a grant uh, application. Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I would say maybe look at the past applications. All of that is public, right? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Well, it's on behind the stacks. Yeah, uh, yeah on behind yeah. the stack. So I would say take a look at those. And I would also say like, don't, if you've never applied for a grant or like, or from, like if you're not familiar with um, um, writing for a grant, don't, don't let that uh, uh, scare you away from applying for it. Because uh, if you have really great ideas for the library, you know, like we need your great ideas. Um, and uh, I feel like, um, you know, there's sort of a formula that you can follow with, uh, you know, applying for the grant. That's pretty simple. But um, if anybody ever wants help with that, I, I'm, I'm available to help. But it sounds like the folks on um, the team can also uh, answer any questions that you might have. That's true. And I appreciate the uh, offer of help for other people as well, Melody. Uh, Shelby has Shelby's a question, question in the chat. Yeah. Oh yeah, I see that. So did you have a specific curation process when selecting the books? Yeah, Shelby, so some like, you know, we we had to do a little bit of a scan of what we already had in our catalog. So, um, you know, we, I believe we already had like, you know, uh, Dr. Kendi's uh, book, um, Unlimited Access ebook. So something like that we didn't use. Um, but we, we tried to, um, you know, we try to do the books that people were wanting to read, but that were written by um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, so that was sort of our kind of focus. And then we also wanted to get as many library-related books in there as well. Um, but uh, that money kind of goes fast. So like we, we were like very limited by um, our funds. And so there were, we had a bigger list, but we, we kind of had to narrow it down. Um, and, you know, it was just conversations that sort of helped us pick it down, but we didn't have a very specific like rubric or anything that uh, helped us select them. Okay, well, uh, I wanna thank Melody. Uh, if you have any more questions that come up uh, anytime during this event or later on, uh, you can ask any of, anybody on the committee or Melody as well. Um, I do want to thank her and the other members who aren't here uh, for working on it. Um, it's a great project. We thought it was a great idea and we hope it continues to be used and uh, can, can be, continues to be cultivated. So uh, thank you for that, Melody. Uh, and next up we have uh, the most recent winner. The project was DMC Rezo Lab, and I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, Y'all can correct me if, if I'm wrong. And that's going to be by Paula, Cheryl, Cheryl, and Suzanne. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Melody. It was wonderful to see the whole process. Um, and uh, my name is Paula Damasceno. I am the Digital Media Commons Multimedia Instruction Coordinator and one of the proposers of this um, for the grant that we got. Um, uh, I will be starting this presentation, uh, which was created by the three of us who applied for the grant, Cheryl Cross, myself, and Suzanne Sawyer. Um, let me, uh, okay. So um, why and, and what is a risograph? Why we proposed that in first place? Um, so when we discovered the risograph, um, we discovered it uh, throughout many universities in the country. And then we realized that in North Carolina, uh, we didn't find one riso printer that was offered um, not for a profit. 
So most of them are for profit, small press, small publishers. Um, and we thought, oh, okay, so we have a makerspace that more and more has um, equipment that can um, be used for um, as a print shop for publishing small editions or um, printing uh, fine art prints. And so uh, our students could benefit from having access to it um, at a cost price that will be um, different than what is charged out there for a, uh, at a profit, uh, for profit organization. So student success was um, one of the main um, motivators for the grant application and then um, for the purchase of the RISA graph. So we aim to either support curricular uh, projects or providing ways uh, for students to express them themselves, for example, um, through zines or through printmaking. Um, another important aspect of uh, the why we proposed uh, the purchase of a risograph is um, innovation itself. And it's related to what I just said about uh, North Carolina and the UNC system not having a risograph. Um, so not uh, so it's a point for recruitment, is a point to be made in terms of innovation uh, for the library. And um, then um, Ultimately, we will enhance the services we offer at the DMC. Um, and when another point is that we imagine that the library could become a small publisher. So if other departments in the library, uh, for example, Special Collections wants to publish a small edition, we can now do it because the risograph is reliable and is fast and um, there are other aspects. Cheryl will be talking soon about sustainability, but um, and it's beautiful. It's a professional, wonderful print that it renders. So, but what is a risograph itself, right? Um, so it is a machine that kind of mixes a Xerox machine with an inkjet kind of machine. So it's a digital duplicator that originally was uh, created in the 70s. Um, it's a Japanese technique, it's a Japanese company. Um, they were invented in Japan in 1958. And I said 70s because I, I kind of blanked, but it was in 1958 and were released in the US in 1986. Originally to be used in offices to uh, uh, give offices and corporations the ability to print their materials themselves really fast, efficiently, and cost efficiently um, uh, do so. Um, and so, but in the last 10 years or so, risograph, risographs became very popular among artists, um, uh, activists, uh, activists um, and for precisely the same reason. So they can publish their own work without relying upon uh, external sources for uh, the printing of their zines, artist books, uh, and Suzanne will go into that in a bit um, with you. So the image you're seeing here is quite likely the one we have um, at the DMC. Um, and this image here on the left, it shows uh, the drums. So when I say it's a mix of Xerox machine inkjet, I left out the silk screen. If you have ever seen a silk screen, it basically needs a screen that you uh, print your ma as a master and you um, you coat with ink and you uh, press it against a, a surface that could be cloth, could be a t-shirt, could be a paper. Um, so the reason mixes it, it does make the master and the, and then you, um, then we mix masters with different colors. And so you can uh, have one piece of paper, have multiple passes to print the multiple colors you're using. Um, 
me go next. Uh, Cheryl will talk about sustainability and the ink um, and how um, it's a great um, uh, ink uh, for our world yeah. to survive. <laughs> okay. Um, Reso duplicators are one of the most environmentally friendly printing machines. The print process produces no ozone and no harmful particulates or gases. And the ink, as Paula said, is organic. It's made from locally sourced rice bran, which would other by, otherwise be discarded. It has 95% lower energy consumption than laser and other heat-based printers. And it is Energy Star certified and EP registered, which is a global rating system for greener electronics. Back to, back to you, Paula. Yes. Um, <laughs> So, and what is it used for a little bit more? Um, just basically, um, it's used for fine arts printings, special projects, prints, uh, zines, artist books, small batch editions. So, um, let me go on. On the right here, we have uh, this wonderful photo book. Uh, from this artist, Kevin Kunstad. And you can see that is a black and white with a little coat of gold ink. And so we, um, there is a not too complex, but uh, I would say medium complexity file preparation for the print to do that um, beautiful uh, type of print with photograph here. Uh, same thing for the left side here. Um, basically, we see two colors and um, this is a fine art print, not a book. Um, and so you can see that the texture is um, beautiful. And um, when you overlap two colors, you can then make a third color, which also a wonderful capability of um, the risograph. So, the difference, as I uh, said before, um, from a Xerox and an inkjet basically is in terms of color is that when you overlap, you can overlap. It's made to overlap without um, leaking colors all over uh, the platform that you're printing on or the machines and to make uh, unique colors, unique color combinations. So this is just an example. Um, of what happens when you combine the yellow, the green, and the teal pink here, um, which Xerox machines, even the color ones cannot do it, neither an inkjet. Um, this is another interesting uh, feature is uh, the dot uh, patterns that the risograph uh, is able to do it. Um, not only it has a, uh, the capability of transform a photograph into dual tone and create the dots that makes the image in different sizes. Uh, you see those are uh, bigger dots and then smaller dots, and then it goes on to be finer and finer. And that's another um, difference that Xerox machines and jets don't do it. And of course, you can also do half, half tones on the file preparation, which we will, um, we will uh, of course, teach people how to do it, to teach uh, patrons how to do so. And I will pass to uh, Cheryl so she can talk even further about file preparations. Okay. Um, as Paula said, preparing files for the RESO um, for printing does require some training. And we uh, three did an online course offered by the Riso Lab at the School of Visual Arts in New York, uh, which was very useful. Uh, it isn't like printing to a regular printer where you send one file and it all prints at the same time. With Riso printing, each color prints on a different pass through the printer and the ink has to dry between passes. And the printer doesn't actually read color from the files. It prints the grayscale image and the color depends on which color you have physically loaded into the printer. 
So you need to separate the parts of the image that you want to print, um, which need to be printed in each color and then create grayscale files for each one of those. Uh, you also have to include a way to register the passes so that everything lines up. So I'm gonna give you a couple quick examples. The first one is a simple drawing. You can see that the end product that has the color in it is made up of these three grayscale PDF files that were sent to the printer. Um, well, theoretically sent to the printer. This was never actually printed. This is an example we did in the class. Um, so each one of these files, like I said, is a grayscale PDF. And so you put that into the printer, whatever color you've got loaded in is gonna print. You're gonna let that dry, and then you're gonna print the next layer. And you can see they've got registration marks up at the top because you will need to um, make any adjustments that need to be made physically where the paper goes through to make sure that things line up. Um, okay, next slide. Yeah, we can go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, so this is how it looks in Photoshop. You can see the what would be the finished product on the main screen. Um, it's kind of small, but over on the right, you can see the layers section, and you can see there's a grayscale layer for each of the ones that um, we showed on the last slide. And then we have a tint layer, which is blue, pink, and black for this particular one. And that just lets you see what it's approximately what it's gonna look like. Um, so you can get it the way you want it. But what you're actually gonna to send to the printer are the gray, the three grayscale layers, which you'll export as PDFs. Okay, next slide. Um, you can also do the same thing with photos. That one was a drawing. Uh, this is a photo. The one in the center is the original photo. Um, and then that's put through a process that they call anti-CMYK, where things are recolored and also separated out into layers for the reso. So you can see, you can do a lot of interesting things with that. And the separating out of the colors is something that you do in Photoshop. Um, let's go to the next slide. These are actual prints that were done at the uh, SVA in New York as part of the class. Um, you may not be able to see it. The one on the left is the first print in a series of, I think, 10. And the one on the right is the last one. Um, you may not be able to see it, but there's a slight misregistration on the first one because you do have to physically line those registration marks up and then they later are trimmed off. But um, you can get a lot of different effects. You can see it's not the same every time it prints either. Um, you can see there's a lot of differences, especially in the sky part as to how it printed. And that's just part of the artistic nature of it. Okay. Hey. <laughs> So um, about instruction, um, we will have two uh, main ways to uh, provide instruction about the Rizzo print. Uh, one is DMC instruction and training, and uh, the other is a collaboration between uh, Special Collections and the Digital uh, Media Commons. Um, and Suzanne will um, talk about let me see if I'm right. Yes, actually, it was Suzanne's slide. Oh, that's all right. You said right. what I was going to say. Perfect. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so, like Paula said, we'll we'll do um, primarily the instructions going to happen in the DMC. But we did um, want to do some collaborating between SCUA and. Um, the DMC. Part of that, um, and this wasn't purchased with grant funds, but we've added a few titles for hands-on reference. Um, these books are in SCUA's collection, reference collection, but they're also available in the DMC for quick and easy access right next to the um, risograph machine, which is nice um, if students want to just kind of reference, particularly like the one on the right is um, got some color charts in it, and it's very helpful to kind of have as a quick reference. 
Um, next slide, please. So we also, um, much like we already do with the Iron Hand Press, um, which was a previous um, innovation and program enrichment grant, we'll be able to integrate in instructional sections with the risograph and artist books into curricula and courses across campus. We'll be able to invite classes to interact with the risograph machine as well as the artist books in part of the same session. What we've done with the um, Iron Hand Press is often we'll divide the class into two and half um, of the class will work um, with Carolyn Schenkel with artist books and um, looking at a variety of materials connected to whatever the curriculum in their classes. And then we also give them a hands-on experience with the iron hand press. We can do things like that with the risograph machine as well. Um, and pictured here are a couple of examples of new artist books in the collection that incorporate risograph printing in some way. And um, we hope to continue to expand this part of the artist books collection for this reason, for those planned collaborative workshops with the DMC. So the DMC day-to-day -day accessibility instruction plan uh, is based in two uh, main ways uh, for uh, access purposes. <laughs> we are going to uh, provide online design strategies for ISO printing. Um, uh, in a Canvas course. Uh, so people who have completed the course and submitted their assignments can then, uh, it's a typo there, can then follow uh, one of the two paths. One is on online submission of their file through a printing request form or take the in-person training to print their work themselves. Then faculty who wishes who wish to develop curriculum using the RISO may request to do so by contacting the DMC to develop an appropriate timeline, appropriate timeline for instruction and printing. Um, so, and we are planning to have the last week of May a sort of a RISO party to start the the accessibility uh, and to just give folks that are interested a chance to uh, learn the basics of file separation and then see how the machine um, is operated. So so um, programming on and outreach in person demo sessions throughout the semester, the fall semester now. Um, of course, Halloween, now that we are back on campus has been something um, that is um, kind of traditional for the DMC. And so we plan to do Halloween prints. Um, and then informational sessions for faculty throughout the semester as well. And um, Suzanne will say a little bit more about our guest speaker Professor Sean Morrissey. So uh, Sean Morrissey is a, an artist and a masterful printmaker in a variety of different print media. He uses screen printing, um, but he also um, uses risograph printing. These um, three examples on the screen are all risograph prints. So what looks like a stack of bricks on the left is actually stacks of individual sheets that you can see in the detail image in the middle. Um, Sean uses a lot of um, architectural elements in his work, brick moldings, gutters, things like that. So um, this is kind of in line with some of the subject matter of his other work. But um, aside from being a practicing artist, Sean's also an associate professor of printmaking at the University of Arkansas. So not only does he use risograph in his own work, but also with his students. And Sean has agreed um, to provide a virtual program for us in which he's going to talk about um, his own creative work with the risograph, as well as how he's using the risograph in the university setting. Um, and we, I was listening to Melody earlier talk about the issue with speakers and COVID and all of that. Well, we can very much relate Melody. Um, he's graciously already rescheduled with us twice um, due to the delay um, for us and actually receiving the risograph and the associated supplies. Um, but he'll be part of our launch programming in the coming year. We think, we hope to have him in the fall talk to us about his work and how he's using the risograph with students. Um, and just on a little unrelated side note, he is indeed related to Morrissey, the Morrissey, the musician. Um, there's quite an age difference, but they're cousins, if I remember correctly. Just a little fact about Sean. Uh, 
<laughs> Back to you, Paula. Okay, so um, just to check in on what we've done so far, we do have the printer here. And so one color of ink came with the printer. So we've done some tests with the black ink that we started with. We've also looked at different paper types and sizes and ordered the correct paper for the printer. We ordered a few different colors of ink and some printing drums, which is the part that pushes the color through a wraparound screen where the master is attached. And we've had a lot of delays, unfortunately, in the delivery of all the supplies due to supply chain issues. Um, so we've just Monday received some of the drums that we need to actually start printing multi-layer prints here. So we're excited about that. And as we mentioned, we have done some staff training through the SBA course, which is gonna really help us get started with this. And next slide. Uh, what we haven't done or don't know yet is that we still we still do have some supplies that we have not yet received. So we're um, waiting for those. We also need to determine what is a reasonable amount to charge for printing and what our workflow and time frame for printing will be. Um, it's like I said, it does need to dry overnight between passes. So it's not a really quick process. So we need to figure out how that's going to work. Uh, we're also deciding whether or not it would be feasible to create a book binding station for students um, to use in the DMC if they want to create a zine or a book from their prints. And yes. back to Paula. Yes. Um, so I just want to, before we finish, just to um, talk about two things. One is that we applied for a $3,000 uh, <laughs> grant and we need to uh, just uh, be grateful, we are grateful uh, for the rest of the money being granted by Mike, by the library itself. Of course, the machine is extremely expense, expensive. Um, the associated um, supplies are not that much, but we did have to uh, make sure before we submitted the, the grant that we could have um, additional funds. And Mike um, gave us the okay to do so, recognized the value of the, the project. So that's, uh, we are immensely grateful for that. And with no further ado, we thank you for listening to our presentation today. And uh, we want to know if you will have any questions. Oh, before I forgot, I'm not in like, I'm graduating today and my mind is all over, but okay, let's do a quick uh, run through the summer 2022 plans. So during May, June, July, we will develop the online instruction, make test prints when the drums arrive and the drums just arrived was it Monday, Cheryl, if I'm not wrong, this Monday for not all, but four drums, yes. which means That's now right. that, yeah. So four arrived on Monday, meaning that now, just now this week, we can then use color, right? So uh, that is exciting, although late, but exciting. Uh, we will be creating a lead guide for access as well. And then in August, we will offer our, our first in-person demo session and schedule and the guest speaker uh, for the fall, hopefully, as Suzanne said. If you have any questions, I will check the chat now. Um, maybe they are there. Thank you all. Um, you know, it's just, it's really collaborative. One of the, I guess, when Melody was talking about like how to uh, write a grant. And I think this grant is very much, there is a, an aspect of collaboration that is, um, that is important. It's important for not only for us to see ourselves, our colleagues, but it's important because the power of offering collaboration having collaboration and offering programs that are collabor co co collaborative, they do reflect on the student's capaci capacity um, to succeed uh, and to integrate knowledge. 
so if you have questions, I like to talk, so interrupt me, please, or we can stop. So you may have said this, um, and I'm sorry if you did, I'm just processing a lot about this uh, particular one, but did you all already know how to use this equipment beforehand? How do you know uh, before the grant? No, no, we did not. I mean, no, the short answer is no. Now we do. Yeah, and that kind of goes into Christine's question in the chat, and then Shelby has a question above that in the chat. Had any of you seen the risograph demonstrated in person before y'all started this? I have. That's where uh, we got to. There is a foundation in New York called Penumbra Foundation. And um, the first photo book that I showed was the photo book that I saw. And I asked, I had a tour of that foundation and um, I saw that machine and I saw the book. It was like, what is that? And the person graciously uh, gave me a run through how it works, what it's used for, and showed me the photo book and how great it is. And that's how we um, then I came back and I talked to Sharon and Susan. So like, I saw that. That's great. And we all got excited. And yeah. I was going to just add to that, Paula, so like you were talking about, about collaboration and synergy and all of that. So I took last summer a um, rare book school class, um, the history of artist books since 1950. And in that class, we did a collaborative risograph um, book, but it was all virtual. So we were designing in groups, um, which now having taken the School of the Visual Arts class and understanding the depth of what goes into preparing a file for risograph, it... I just know how amazing it was. We were actually able to do it all virtually, all being at different levels. Some people had used risograph, some hadn't, but we did actually see someone um, give a virtual presentation and we saw the risograph working, but no, I hadn't seen it in, in person at all. But when, Reza, when uh, Paula mentioned it, I was like, oh my gosh, I just did this in a class and it's really interesting. And that would be so cool to bring that here for students and add to the DMC's technology and all of that. So we, we all, like she said, got very excited. And Cheryl, she didn't say that, but the prints that she showed that was a transformation of a photograph into a print is Cheryl's print from SVA, right, Cheryl? That's right. So um, Shelby has a question in the chat. The risograph sounds like an art nerd's dream. I'm glad y'all will help promote access to it. Do you plan on targeting certain clubs and classes to market these classes and how? Yes, we do plan to do so. So as we have done in the past at the DMC with all the programming and outreach, we will directly contact, um, not that we need to be the only ones to do so, please anyone in the library is, we are happy to have y'all as uh, colleagues and especially liaisons, uh, but the DMC and the group, our especially the grant group, we will contact directly departments uh, to gather interest in using the risograph. We acknowledge that not all people will be interested in learning how to separate files. So we will offer the service um, of file separation and printing for uh, the ones who do not want to engage with Photoshop necessarily. Um, another way that we are going to engage, as I said before, uh, is uh, the demonstrations throughout the semester and information sessions throughout the semester. So um, that those are the main ways that we are going um, to um, make folks aware of what this novelty and how it can be used. 
I think too, I mean, Paula, you've shared other ideas about um, outreach to the community and that sort of thing. And I think um, because things were so delayed in getting here, it's kind of put off those plans. So we've kind of scaled back a little bit as we've decided what exactly we're gonna do and figuring out the logistics and all of that. But I think um, there's more to come in the coming years. It's just a matter of us getting more proficient with the machine and um, all of those things. Thank you, Suzanne, for that, because it's important to clarify that it was not like one delay. You need to understand that we spent the whole, this two, this the when was it? Was it August that we got? We spent two semesters in a back and forth, an eternal, perennial back and forth with the supplier. And we thought, oh, okay, at a certain point, we thought, we thought, okay, it's a month delay. That's all right. Let's go ahead and plan. Then a month more, three, four. Then we said, okay, let's stop. That's not like we have other things to do. We cannot be creating. Also, we realized that some, um, some of our stakeholders were getting anxious about it naturally because it's such a great thing. But then we, 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 we needed to cool down and say, look, we will get back together when we have the drums. And not only the drums, the inks were the first ones who were really delayed. We got color inks. I don't know, Cheryl can speak uh, about that better, but so it was like, we, oh, okay, it's just a little delayed. No, it's more, it's more, it's more. So we stopped and said, well, okay, when we have the materials here, and that was great because gave us the, uh, another thing too, is that um, gave us the opportunity to be trained properly. Our first supplier, uh, stated that we would be trained by them. And the train that they provided was a half an hour run through real fast through the machine and then they disappeared. So they disappeared so much so that this week is the first week we were um, told that they actually outsourced their services to another supplier in South Carolina. We just learned that this week, this very week today. So that's just an example, but we are getting there and we'll be beautiful. Yeah. Okay, well, I want to thank both groups, um, especially for, you know, volunteering to, you know, do take on this extra work during a pandemic. Um, as y'all have alluded to, it's, been uh, added a lot of extra problems uh, to everything that you try to do. So we appreciate that, uh, both for your efforts and in, in going ahead and applying. Um, we really appreciate it. These are both uh, exciting and innovative uh, programs, and we look forward to seeing what happens in the future with them. So um, we're running a little short on time now, so I want to make sure that everybody knows that the links, everything you need to know is behind the stacks under committees the Innovation and Program Enrichment Grant, uh, the important dates to remember. May 20th, if you want to get feedback from the committee on your grant application, you can still put in a grant application by 5 p.m. June 10th, uh, but if you do it after May 20th, again, you won't get feedback from the committee. Thanks for the link, Sam. I appreciate that. Um, and I, th I think we're all done for today. Um, Thanks to uh, Sam and Jenny for helping us out with this. This has been great. I really hope this is the last virtual one we have to do. Um, <laughs> so hopefully to see everybody in person uh, for the next one. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. I dropped a link to behind the stacks in the um, chat. Everyone have a great week. Remember staff development week is next week and uh, see you all um, around later. Bye. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Paula. Congrats again, Paula. Have a good Yeah, I, I wanted to just uh, thanks the, the committee. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you a lot. I just forgot to say that. Is it still recording for the rack? Okay. Yes, it's still Bye. recording, so we have it on record. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone, and have a great uh, week or weekend if I don't see you all today or tomorrow. Bye.